Welcome to the latest installment of Tiber's Watchcast, an audio offshoot of the Substack newsletter Tiber's Watch List. Today we have the latest in my series of podcasts devoted to the classics of the new millennium, conversations about those movies that have come out since the year 2000 and can legitimately or arguably be called great, and the arguing is part of the fun. To talk about the Spike Lee 2006 heist drama Inside Man, please welcome my good friend and old Boston Globe colleague, Wesley Morris. Wesley is currently a critic at large at the New York Times, where he has waxed profound on such subjects as Tina Turner, Aaron Rodgers, race and racism in American popular culture, and his pandemic mustache. Uh, he has been at the Times for since 2015. Uh, he wrote for Grant Land for two years before that. And from 2002 to 2013, he was at the desk next to mine as my fellow Boston Globe film critic. He's the only person to have won the Pulitzer Prize for criticism twice, once for the Globe in 2012 and once and again in two, 2021 for the Times. He's also the best, maybe the best possible person to have as a work buddy. And it is Aww. a genuine pleasure to have him on the podcast and to hang out with him again and a good excuse to get him away from the book that he has been writing for the past few years. <laughs> so welcome, my friend. Oh, How are you? So mean. That's that's <laughs> very nice. Thank you. No, mean. Um, no, I've been in that I'm, position. I'm almost done. I'm almost done, hopefully. I know. Today. Like, I know. You know. I've been in that position. It does get finished. Why do people do it? It's so ugh, terrible. <laughs> Because they hold, you know, this idea of money out in front of us, basically. You know? That's not what happened to me. I wish some, uh, I mean, <laughs> actually, you know what? I've been talking a lot to people about um, when when there just isn't enough money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's just not enough money to make something worth doing. Because um, then you got to do it and the money... The money, the, like the high from the money, just kind of goes away. And yes, it does. With this, yes, it with does. This work. Yeah. Um, ask, ask me about my royalty checks from the books I've written that uh, don't exist. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know. Money cannot be the reason to write a book. Exactly. Unless you're Prince Harry, but even then, I just don't know if it's worth it. <laughs> um. <laughs> So and let's talk about that, movies. So. <laughs> yeah, never does. Should introduce you to my friend who ghostwrites for famous people. Um, mm -hmm. That's a living. So Inside Man. Um, when I was putting this series together and talking with um, our fellow movie critics and reviewers about what kind, what movies should be on the list, what should we be considering? The Spike Lee movie that everybody kept going to and was like, oh, 25th Hour from 2002. The <laughs> That's that seems to be the one that like, oh, yes, that's the the that's, you know, his high watermark. You immediately went to Inside Man, which is not a disrespected movie in any sense. But I wanted to know. So why'd you go for that one? I mean, I just feel like, OK, so. There's something about Spike Lee where people just kind of they just tap out and yeah. then they tap back in. And when they tap back in, there's all this stuff that they missed. Or, you know, I I, I kind of resent that people think the 25th hour is is like the great Spike Lee movie. Because, first of all, it's just actually false. But I because but I also I'm open to people loving it. I think there's a lot of I don't dislike that movie at all. I just I feel like the thing that you want in a Spike Lee movie is just kind of a looseness and a, a kind of a, like abandon, but not the abandonment of the things that when he abandons them makes the movies sort of slack and interminable, um, like a kind of formal looseness that also keeps its shape somehow. Um, and I think that the thing I love about Inside Man is that there's this tension here that you can feel between Spike Lee's kind of wild nature, right? Like his his ability, like his his refusal, like his interest in shagginess, right? Like in in narrative shagginess, in mm -hmm. um, in all the visual beauty and the sort of ingenious shot composition, working at cross purposes with some storytelling sometimes 
And so the tension here, I think, is, but I don't know this for a fact, but I feel like knowing that Brian Grazer is mm-hmm. the producer of this movie, a guy who's, you know, made many kind of Hollywood blockbuster, you know, a lot of dramas, worked with, you know, is Ron Howard's, you know, right hand um, or had been for a long time. I don't know if they're still working together, but I just feel like there is this real studio imperative working against Spike Lee's maverick urges. And it's set in New York. It's a it's a genre movie that that constantly is leaving a genre to do other stuff. Um, and and yet it's suspenseful. Like I got emotional a few times rewatching mm. this. Um, and it it has more to. It's one of those movies that says more by not saying anything. Right. Like just watching people react, behave, emote. Um, I just think it's much deeper than the caper movie it's received as being. Well, um, to me, that puts it in the company of the great New York movies that he's consciously, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he's gone on record as saying he loves a dog day afternoon to death. He was, you know, happy to like tackle a, a Sidney Lumet style movie. Um, and he even a cast, there are two cast members from Dog Day Afternoon in small roles mm-hmm. in the Inside Man. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, and I'm also thinking of like taking a Pelham one, two, three, and all of that, that whole genre of 70s New York movies that are on the surface genre movies, um, but say so much more about human nature and human interaction um, in this pressure cooker of, of the city. Um, I do think it's interesting that uh, this was originally purchased by Brian Grazer and Imagine Entertainment to be a Ron Howard movie. So imagine <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Imagine this. So, but uh, but Ron Howard, uh, um, ironically enough, ended up going off to make a uh, Cinderella Man, which I think is one of the best things he's ever done. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he's somebody I have very you know mixed reactions to his work. Um, Don't we all? Yeah, <laughs> but. You know, what, what What would Ron Howard's Inside Man have looked like? Well, it wouldn't have starred Denzel Washington. Probably not. Uh, it, it, I mean, it just wouldn't have known how to bring all of these side characters to life. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this wonderful moment where, you know, they figure out that there's Albanian being spoken somehow in the bank and nobody can figure it out. And we're Hosha. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the the specific speech being given here is is you know it's a it's a plot point, but before we know what's going on, um, unless you're an Albanian speaker, uh, Denzel Washington has to find somebody who actually speaks Albanian, and so he goes out into the crowd that's assembled outside this bank where the heist is happening, and he's like, "Does anybody speak Albanian?" And they play the their you know they're playing the speech. And some guy just instantly, a construction worker, just instantly is like, yo, yo, I, I got this. And he he gets brought into the trailer and he's like, that's Albania. And, you know, Denzel's like, what's he, what's what's being said? Uh, and just knowing what to do. And the punchline, of course, is that the guy's like, I don't speak Albanian. I was married to an Albanian and she drove me fucking crazy. And this this music that you're playing, the speech was like the bane of my existence for the entire time I was married. Um, and that's just such a great detail. But I mean, and I guess Ron Howard could have done that, but would he have known the exact right person mm-hmm. to the exact right New Yorker mm-hmm. to make that happen? Um, the the Sikh guy who gets his turban removed when he gets kicked yeah. out of the bank. Like, that, William. that guy, that character's umbrage. And then there's a just a great you know, terrible moment where like, he's like, he's like spending three minutes enumerating all of the indignities, demoralizations of his experiences, September 11th. And Denzel is just like, yeah, but I bet you can still get a cab. (laughs) (laughs) That would definitely have not been in the Ron Howard. It's just, there's just so many wonderful, just salty, unsavory 
things that just don't interest. I don't know what inch. I mean, I can tell by watching Ron Howard's movies what interests Ron Howard. But mm -hmm. Ron Howard is somebody who doesn't make sense in the present. And Spike Lee is somebody who doesn't make sense in the past. Right. Mm. And his best movies aren't set long ago. They're set right now. Right. And there's an immediacy to this movie that I just don't know who else could have gotten in the way that he gets it. Mm. Makes me wish he'd do more in this vein. Um, let, let me just for uh, listeners and viewers who have not seen Inside Man, let me let's just briefly talk about the plot. It is a okay. bank house movie. It takes place in New York. Um, not on a dog day afternoon, but uh, on, uh, it's never right quite clear what the weather is, but it's a, it's a nice day. Um, Seems like spring to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Clive Owen is the leader of a band of bank robbers who are mostly masked and come in and take hostages of the um, customers and bank personnel, get them all in identical um, uh, jumpsuits to match the bank robbers and um, proceed to uh, do some drilling. And but it's not clear what they're after. And meanwhile, on uh, a sort of separate plot point, well, first of all, Denzel Washington and his partner, played by Chiwetel Tell for are brought in to, um, you know, um, as detectives, New York City police detectives. And there's Willem Dafoe as, as, as the head cop. Um, I just, you know, how often <laughs> do you get to see Willem Dafoe in uniform? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and the relationship between those two, the detectives and the cop is, is quite juicy. Um, and then there's a separate plot point with the, uh, the head of the bank, the president and chairman of the board of the bank, um, played by Christopher Plummer as one of those untouchable Manhattan rich people, um, just whose wealth has, um, you know, cosseted from anything, from being touched by anything. Um, very worried about, um, the robbers getting to a particular safety deposit box and bringing in a fixer played by Jodie Foster in one of the more unusual roles of her career, I would say. I would um, say this is one of the best. It's one of my favorite Jodie Foster I parts agree. and performances. Why? Um, Because it's, I mean, it's funny. Like she never, I don't know what it means to say against type uh, generally when it comes to her. But there is definitely... I mean, she's playing somebody who understands what a particular kind of femininity can do in in a corporate setting and in a power setting. Um, I mean, she's wearing power suits. I yeah. We never see this person on a Saturday afternoon. Um, but I wonder I wonder what her weekend situation is like. She's wearing a power somebody, suit. <laughs> maybe. Maybe she is. Um but this is somebody who really understands at the very least how to dress to how to dress for work. And there's a like smoothness and like confidence, all of that um, neurosis that she brings to her parts, um, that mix of confidence and self-doubt. The self-doubt part is completely erased in this performance. She just gets to be she just gets to be totally confident and knowing right like yeah. she is very good at whatever this job is <laughs> and, and it's never clear what the job it's is. never clear what the job is talk to me off the record off the, everything about you is off the record just talk to me well i gave him an incentive okay did he go for it no but i'd say he's considering it he's smart isn't he he thinks he is yeah one of your types like ivy league type you're the well-educated? That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You talk like him, so think like him. What do you think he's going to do? Well, he's not going to kill anyone. How do you know? Because he's not a murderer. How do you know? I got news for you. Most of the guys up in Sing Sing weren't murderers until they killed somebody. You never know what a person will do until you push him into a corner. But it doesn't seem like you pushed him into a corner. It doesn't, does it? Seems more like he chose the corner. You're right. So, you through? I guess. You're saying I'm dismissed? Yes, I am. You got a card in case I need to call you? Oh, please don't take this personally, but uh, no. I don't think you can afford me. Well, don't take this personally, Miss White. Kiss my black ass, okay? Careful, Detective Fraser. 
My bite's much worse than my bark. I, the competence that she is allowed to exude then moves her in this performance into some new zone, which is sexy. Mm-hmm. She's somebody who works really hard, I think, in her in her work to not be obviously considered that way. Um, but this is a part where like she's leading with that, right? right? Um, that's well, the she knows the character scene. knows how to use it. Yes, exactly. Um, and there's just I don't know, you can see these other actors when she gets in a scene with them, they're like, oh shit, you brought it today. <laughs> And it's just such a pleasure, like, you know, Christopher Plummer and Denzel just like figuring out how to how to work with her. Because, I mean, I imagine, you know, she's who get there's nobody more professional than Jodie Foster. Um, but I also I mean, I don't know, I've never worked with her, but she seems like a professional, you know, actor. Uh, I've interviewed her um, a couple of times and she is um, extremely present and very warm but also incredibly professional. Uh, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's the sense you get. Yeah, she's coming to the set prepared. Right. Um, but I wonder what it's like to come to the set prepared in a Spike Lee movie, right? Because there's, I don't, I just, you watch all the people in this film and he gets the best work from every single person who does anything in this movie. Um, I mean, it's not a great Clive Owen performance, but, it's the best. Well, he's he's masked the entire time, which right. is a problem. But it right, and that's my own. Like I've got a couple misgivings about this film, and one of them is the fact that you have this great actor who you don't really, whose whose excellence is sort of neither here nor there. But I think that actually is a moral choice, right? Mm-hmm. Like given what the movie is actually about, I think there's something about the sort of denial of his charisma that is interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also, as an actor, is a challenge he can't quite surmount. Well, I think in his case, in the case of his character, Dalton, Dalton Russell, there's a huge backstory that yeah. we just have to fill in for ourselves. Why is this guy doing this? We never know. There's never a motivation. I mean, we understand at the end why he's done this particular job, but there's so much about this guy we don't know. Mm. Um, nor are we expected to know it's just not relevant did this work this movie work for you do you like it i i do like it and i hadn't seen it since it came out and i watched it again yesterday and i enjoyed it for all its lumetishness um Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know all Mm -hmm. the the character parts the juicy dialogue all the shit that denzel is doing um which i mean because he's having so much fun he's really really enjoying this role um the interplay between all the actors um the plot at the end of the day doesn't make any sense Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that you know at the end of the toward the end of the movie i started doing the math and it was like oh okay i'm having fun with this movie but it's not adding up um i'm gonna have to let that go Uh, (laughs) and i and I, i did um but uh and it was first time screenwriter um who was a lawyer uh and who hasn't done much since there's apparently after they made this movie and it was it's the biggest hit of spike lee's career by like um uh factor wow. two um yeah. made made about 88 million dollars which is like twice as much as any movie he's ever made including malcolm x um and uh and there was talk of a sequel and spike wanted to do a sequel and uh, from about 2006 to 2011, it sounds like it was in various stages of development and then it never happened, um, mm-hmm. which Lee claimed was because, you know, nobody wanted to invest in him. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that may very well be true. Um, there is a Netflix movie called um, Inside Man that what's it, I have it, came out in 2019. And it's called Inside Inside Man Most Wanted, um, and it's based on the same. It's, it's the credits are it's based on the characters developed by the screenwriter, um, but all the mm. names of the characters are different. I haven't seen it, so oh, um, okay. yeah, I, I can't see this movie going anywhere else. I think it exists on its own. Um, no, I mean, and I think that's the beauty of it in some ways. Yeah, 
it felt complete by the time you know when he gets home to cassandra freeman right also you know just i mean there's just such a like the the sort of beautiful grace note of that of mm-hmm. that little bit um i just loved how much i mean there are things in this movie for as much as it's like lumet lumet would never do right it doesn't the shagginess of a lumet movie is almost always in service of the plot and i think here i think the shagginess is really in service to personality and character Mm. not character development but just character right and 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 the way people the way new yorkers are right. with each other and the way new yorkers are period like the woman when clive owen is like yo everybody's gonna take their clothes off and there's this one woman right who is jewish woman who's like fuck you i'm not taking my clothes off shame on you and she says <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazier than that she says go ahead make my day <laughs> if you want to kill me i'm right. not taking off my clothes um but then there's this interrogation you know the, the structure of the movie it's not a framing device it's just a thing that it, there are these cutaways to these interrogation sequences but that that the detectives chiwetel Ejiofor and, and denzel washington are doing with the people who the, the hostages right and flash from flash forwards where they're right. trying to figure out which of the hostages are actually the robbers right and it's a great conceit. I love it. It lets Spike Lee scratch his documentary filmmaking itch. Um, that's more than an itch. It's like, it's actually his great talent. Um, and it lets him incorporate that talent into this yeah. sort of fictional movie. Anything else you want to share with us? No. You sure? Yeah. Could you give us the names of the bank robbers? Maybe? Oh. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, sweetheart. You okay? Awful. Was it bad? I mean, they made us strip. They made us take off our clothes. I don't understand why they had to do that. I really just thought I, did, I thought I was going to be killed. Well. All right, my dear. Okay. I can go. No. <laughs> no, you gotta stay. You gotta stay. No, you go. <laughs> don't stay. <laughs> Did you rob the bank? <laughs> you did, you rob, did you rob the bank? No. While he was making this, or around the same time as he was making Inside Man, he was also making um, When the Levees Break, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. his mm-hmm. four-part epic on Hurricane Christina. So he was knee-deep in documentary filmmaking right at this time. And I think, you know, I think he knows he is really willing to just accept the truth. He is, he's one of the great American nonfiction filmmakers. And I think, I think it's his best mode. And frankly, in the fiction films, the mode in which there's this frisson of real tension that kind of comes off the screen. Um, And there's just these beautiful, every single one of those interrogation sequences is wonderful because the people in them I don't, it's one of those movies where I don't know what was written and I don't know what was improvised. Right. And there's this moment where that woman who refused to take her clothes off in the bank is like, you know, I'm terror. I was terrified. I hated it. She gets very emotional. And then Denzel's like, okay, did you do it? (laughs) Did you rob the bank? And she's with them. This actress is with them. And she's like, mm. no, I didn't rob the bank at all. She's so present in their presentness. And just there's a spontaneity happening between all those actors. Mm-hmm. Um, like when they get Ken Young to come in and, or Ken Young to come in yeah. and, you know, talk about his experience. And he's like, well, how do you know this woman is the woman that you're saying is the woman that you're saying it is? He's like, she had great, she had great tits. That's how I know. And then you meet that that woman shows up next and and she's talking about, you know, being looked at that way. Like, oh, do you want to? Oh, so why don't you just I can bend over and you can take a picture if you want. And it's one of those moments, you know, Spike Lee is a complicated, bad relationship with women, I would say, um, as a filmmaker with the women in his movies. Uh, But this was one where it just felt like this is just the way it would probably be. This mm-hmm. isn't Spike Lee imposing 
his preferences onto a plot. This is just human behavior. And this is a man that would say this to two men um, mm-hmm. in the privacy of their masculinity. Um, right. I don't and, know. And, just... and a woman who would respond to um, Chiwetel Ejiofor's character, basically looking at her boobs during the interrogation. Um, and, and, and at first, it's just very subtly done um, so that she and the audience pick up on it. Um, but then it becomes part of the part of the response. Right. Um, I don't know. I just, you know, it's funny because I was thinking after I told you I wanted to do this, I'm like, I really, am I, what am I asserting here about this movie? <laughs> like, am I saying that, you know, it's, am I saying that it's as great as do the right thing or uh, as great as I think Clockers is um, as, as very good as I think, you know, a lot of Malcolm X is. Um, I think I am <laughs> in okay. its way, right? I think that there's something really satisfying about a director who can only ever be himself for better and for worse. Figure out a way to harness that identity for the purposes of pleasing us, right? for the pleasure of making an audience happy, not upsetting them. Although there are some things in this movie that are, you know, classic Spike Lee beehive rattles, um, like the video game the kid plays. Right. um, Which, you know, is just, I I totally know where that comes from. And the idea that the kid is still embracing this hip hop ethos that Spike Lee has very mixed feelings about. Um, Like he keeps that in the movie and the kid still feels like he wins, right? Um, I just, I just feel like this movie is, (sighs) it's so true to who he is while also obeying the rules that a genre asks of him for more or less that I don't know what Brian Grazer's instructions were, like what Brian Grazer's needs are as a producer representing Universal Studios. But I just feel like the tension between Spike Lee's spikeness and the priorities of these other institutions, um, the heist movie, the studio, really brought something interesting and new out of him right that is a pleasure to experience as a member of the audience i do wonder a couple of things i wonder um one is you know what led brian grazer to um bring spike lee into it, it was, so this movie comes after two of probably the worst received movies of spike's filmography i um, love one of them i love one of them too and it's the same one um bamboozled which is a movie that has aged very well um i think and really needs to be reappraised yeah. um, oh that's i meant the other one <laughs> you're, are you kidding me i love she hate me you do okay <laughs> all right that's funny then we're in office camps here it's a um, mess i'm not crazy i mean i know yeah. it's i know it's like operationally terrible but there's just a, <laughs> there's like a there's a lunacy to it that I just love. It's like it's the most Spike Lee. I I mean I think he will direct anybody's screenplay, right? If there's something in it that he thinks he can work with, he will just do it. And there's just something about that script that doesn't. I mean, obviously it's absurd, but he believes in some aspect of it, and the movie is just alive with just nonsense but something that feels true to who the person who made it is and you know i cannot defend it in the larger scheme of his career but as this individual (laughs) uh snapshot i just i i love anyway so go on that's 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 kind of how i feel about bamboozled which which honestly is more of a document. The best parts of it are the parts that are closer to the documentary. Although the mm-hmm. crazy parts mm-hmm. are also closer to what you're talking about. Um, right. Anyway, both of those movies were not well received. Uh, why does Brian Grazer come with this 
big, you know, Lumetti movie and say, Spike, I want you to do this. And does Lee, and I wish I could ask him this. I've talked to him many times over the years, although not recently. Um, does he see this as a, at any point, part of his brain see this as a way to show Hollywood he can make a traditional movie? A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. A hundred. I believe that. I don't know. I mean, it just, that's how it feels, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, y'all, y'all know the whole history of these bank robbery movies. I'm going to make one the way I would do it. And this is what it would look like. Right. But um, it's still going to be commercial as hell. Yes. Yes. Because I've got Denzel and Jodie Foster. Um, and I'm going to let them be these really interesting versions of themselves. Um, but that are, you know, with Denzel, it's not so much that it's, that it's new, but he got Denzel to be fully present yes. for, for everything he's asking for. He's like full movie star here. And, you know, Jodie Foster, meanwhile, you know, it's funny because I remember the first time I saw this, I forgot she was in it. Um, and she shows up after like, what, 23, 24 yep. minutes. And you're just like, oh, oh. and this is what I thought she was going to be like a detective or like, I don't know what I thought the role was going to be. But then she shows up and this is her job. I'm like, oh, geez, this is this is a, this is smart casting. Very, very smart casting. And that's actually one of the great things about the movie is that it's got high and low. I mean, it's not mm-hmm, mm-hmm, just, mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not just police New York. Um, it, and it's not just Christopher Plummer as the fat, you know, as the rich evil dude. She's this kind of go-between that um, indicates a whole level of power politics and gamesmanship in mm-hmm. the city that these that this particular genre of movie often alludes to, you know, like taking a Pelham one, two, three, but you don't really see, you know, mm-hmm. um, you don't see the games. You don't see the, uh, um, the power games at uh, Le Cirque, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yes. And the other, look, but conversely, you also never get the sort of street level, you know, blue collar energy that sort of informs the entire movie from right. a lot of those movies, right? Um, I mean, the thing about Lumet that was so good was that, you know, you really believe that he could get, you know, the greatest actors to seem like their jobs were actually, you know, construction or you know whatever whatever they're not doing at juilliard he could get a juilliard person (laughs) to make you believe that that was what they were doing um i just love how interested spike lee is in how new york sounds how many different rungs of the social ladder in the city he can he can climb in order to make the movie feel complete um all those people in the bank i mean you know, this weirdly makes you nostalgic for people gathering in banks, right? You could not, you could make this movie now and have anybody believe it. Um, Because banks are, I mean, I go to banks like twice a year. There's nobody there. <laughs> well, the, 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 the old fashioned bank nearest to me is now a dispensary. So there's plenty of people there. So Right. Well, right. But they ain't giving out money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just feel like I don't know what would have led Brian Grazer to to give this movie to Spike or to ask Spike Lee to do it if that's the the way it happened. But um, I'm glad he did because, you know, he's got so many chips on his shoulder about so many things. And I'm glad that he was able to prove that he could do a thing that people probably didn't think he could. Right. Correct. Um, For all sorts of ridiculous reasons. Well, the racism is part of it, but also it's the racism in tandem with Spike Lee's own personality, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. The idea that a studio, you know, I'm sure that, I don't know what the rap is. I mean, if they're talking about, if, if, you know, the studios are talking about, like, not making Paul Thomas Anderson movies, you best believe they're talking about not making Spike Lee movies, right? That's why The Five Bloods is on Netflix. Right, and, right. You know, lucky right. we got lucky we got that because we wouldn't have it now. Right, and so I don't know. Wait, is he still making that Viagra musical? Is that 
Do you know? About uh, this? Yes, I do know about it, and I don't know what stage of development, if if at all, it is. But just the word Spike Lee Viagra musical, <laughs> I, I'm there. That's basically she hate me too, right? Like, <laughs> um, or Chirac Inside Out, or yeah, I mean, I just I don't know. I just think that there is, you know, part of me always wonders what these great idiosyncratic American directors would do with more studio time. Um, But then, you know, I don't know, because you look at a movie like Chirac, which I have a lot of problems with, Mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm always grateful that that person gets to make movies because there's always going to be something he's never, nobody makes me mad the way he makes me mad when the thing doesn't work. Right. Um, And so there's something really satisfying about him sort of being off left to his own devices a lot of the time. But I mean, the reason I picked this movie of his 2000s movies is because uh, this is just the one that has the most restraint that, that also does not feel like he's holding anything back. Um, and I don't know if that's a combination of his having not written this movie and not produced it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to disrespect John Killick, who was a person that Spike Lee has worked with a lot of, you know, many times. But this is a completely new relationship. Um, and I just think that these two people getting to know each other um, in the filmmaking process, I think it really served so many aspects of this movie. I'm trying to think who else was new. I mean, it's the second time he'd worked with a, with a Matthew Libatik, the the mm-hmm. cinematographer, mm-hmm. and the camera work. The camera work in the movie is phenomenal. It's, great. it's really um, good. I especially like that. Um, I, I read that for all the scenes with Clive Owen, they're using a steady cam because he's so in control and everything with Denzel's handheld. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And and I don't know if you if you notice, camera is always moving in the first hour of the movie. Um, just never stops yeah. moving, and in the yeah. second hour definitely does slow down it's really just thematically and visually it's really well thought out um it was the 11th time he'd worked with terence blanchard um Mm -hmm. and the score i think does something really interesting it 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 gives a this this new york crime genre um it harkens back to like Elmer Bernstein, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, at the same time, it gives it a new kind of epic sense because um, mm-hmm. it's a very orchestral score. It's a very yeah. present score. Um, not as present as Oppenheimer, but very present. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I think, yeah, I mean, I do think that there's something about the way the movie, I mean, the music, it it gives it a grandeur, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. it, it completely and all where are we 20 exchange place yeah I mean I guess in theory there's some grandeur down there but there's also a lot of the opposite of grandeur historically um, and so there's something about the way there's like a like, like an opulence to this music um, that is in contrast with you know the reality of the circumstances and yet you know, you see this shot, there's this shot of, of of Clive Owen standing in the bank vault, and it's just a straight on shot that sh- it's like a medium close up. And well, it's a it's a long shot, actually, because you can see his whole body and he's looking, I think it's shot, there's an archway and some gating. Um, and you can see the money in the vault behind him. And it, you know, the the combination of the framing, the music, and you know. Clive Owen's carriage it just there's just so it's so handsome I guess I've never seen a handsomer heist movie hmm. Hmm. Um, and yet they also do find space for um, the uh, the classic spike um, tracking shot the, the dolly shot yeah 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 which you know there I mean he has to do it <laughs> I think there is I have seen a there is a movie or two that in which he hasn't done it, but, um, and I, you know, well, why not say, do it here? Right. 
Well, and he does it at the at the right time. And what would mm-hmm. be it's the it's the um, Chief Brody seeing the shark on the beach, um, you know, vertigo yeah. shot. Except it's not that. It's Spike wheeling out the dolly and having um, Denzel right after the execution. Um, and uh, uh, one of the hostages appears to be shot, and everybody rushes to the scene. And that's when you get the patented Spike Lee dolly shot where the character appears to be rushing forward, but not walking. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I would love to talk to him about that. Has, have you ever read what that's about for him? Is it just a signature? No. I mean, you know, I've scholarship about like, you know, film theory sorts of things, but never him in his own words, sort of explaining why he does it. Right. Um, it's I wonder if, it's right, I wonder if it would be as simple as like, you know, it's just, it's a signature for me. Right. Um, right. And I feel like I have to do it because I expect it of myself. Right. Um, I think that the one other thing about this movie is like, it's weirdly deep when you think about the idea of, there's that moment in the vault, they're in the vault and the kid is just, he just brings the kids some lunch and you- And they're sitting on stacks of money. Sitting on stacks of money. And he asks, um, he brings, you know, they're, he's talking about this video game and how harsh it is. And the kid's understanding of what the bank robbery is completely corresponds to the reality of his understanding of how the world works, right. both probably according to his, I don't, I don't, we don't know anything about this kid's neighborhood, but like he is not dressed like a person who is is from the land of this video game where like it's a bunch of like gangsters killing each other right. on the street in the most right. violent possible way. But there's something about hip hop culture that gives him this understanding about black people and their relationship to money and taking it. Um, even if it's from other black people versus what Clive Owen appears to be doing to the kid, which is robbing an institution. And both these things, he conflates these things as being the same right. um and you know the thing i like about that scene is he's wrong <laughs> yeah and clive owen knows but, he's wrong and everybody knows well i mean every adult knows he's wrong right but there's something about how the nobody tells him santa claus isn't real mm. um and i just feel like that's something that I don't know. It feels like would this be tolerable if Ron Howard had that exact same scene in his movie? It would be more didactic, um, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and it would be there would be more of a moral lesson, and the kid would be made to understand that. I think, mm-hmm. uh, even yeah. if it was just a, a line of dialogue, it would be you you know the the kid would have to be you know um, enlightened. Uh, mm-hmm. And that doesn't yeah. happen. That doesn't. No. Uh, I mean, Clive Owen says, you know, tell your dad to, you know, take the video game away or something like that. I forget the exact line. Um, uh, but he doesn't say it to the kid. I mean, he doesn't, you know, um, upbraid the kid for. Uh, and really, that's there for Spike to go out and get a graphic design house to design the most <laughs> heinously violent, ridiculous you know, gangster rap video game, um, just because he's so horrified by that aspect. But it's it's so of a piece with like how you know his movies. Like, there's a whole bit in Clockers, for instance, um, involving this malt liquor brand that's called the Bomb mm-hmm. that does recur throughout his movies. It shows up in a couple other films too, right? Um, and it's just the most ridiculous, <laughs> um, kind of assault on uh an aspect of of black culture that he obviously disdains right um and rather than you know in the movie is essentially about the extraction of one element of that culture into some other environment mm-hmm. um and i don't know i just there's a kind of the like, consistency of these ideas moving from really difficult movies into you know extremely commercial ones uh is interesting to me and i think it explains a lot of ways why 
like if why certain studios don't want to work with him. And I think it all, it makes me wonder, you know, what if the person running, you know, Warner brothers now was a black person, um, but not right now, but maybe 15 years ago, although maybe right now, I don't know. Well, let's um, see, you know, once I get rid of Zaslav, we'll see who they bring in. <laughs> but what would you, I mean, I feel like one of the first things I would do would be giving Spike Lee the keys to something. Yeah. Like, I would have Spike Lee come in and be like, Spike, what do you want to do? Um, we have, you know, $50 million for you to do it. You know, I know that's not a lot of money to you maybe now, but that's what we're going to give you. What, do you. what can you do for us for $50 million? Which, you know. Um, you know, I'd he'd be one of the 15 people I'd have in to like <laughs> make my like make my movie sleep. Okay, who uh, are some of the others? Quick. Oh, uh, who would I mean that's a great question. I mean Barry Jenkins. I would love to see what Barry uh-huh. Jenkins is up to. Trey Schultz. Mm. Um, who I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he's up to something, but I yep. wonder what that is. Uh Oh man, uh, who uh, the, who was the guy who made Beef? I can't remember that oh. that, that that filmmaker's name, but like that guy, I want to know ASAP what he's doing. Um, you know, uh, D. Reese. There's a person who you know what I would do. I would call Tanya Hamilton who made this movie called Night Catches Us. Yes. Um, from 2000, is that also 2006, 2007, something like that? It was what I would describe as a Sundance movie. But I don't think that person ever made another film. Tanya and Hamilton, yeah. I, I would have her in and ask her, what have you been doing? <laughs> what would you like to do? Um, because... I, I just felt like that was a movie that didn't work, but it's a first movie and there was so right. much ambition in it. Right. Uh, I would just be, I would just be grounding up all these people who do interesting things who Miranda July. I mean, she still makes things, but you know, I'd be curious to know what, if, if here's a, here's a budget. Do you want to write your own script? We got a pile of screenplays that nobody wants to make. I want to make them. <laughs> do you want to pick one of these? Um, I don't know. I'd be going to film schools, like seeing who's around there. I'd be going into neighborhoods. I'd be, I'd go to TikTok, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and just, I would just be watching a bunch of TikToks and being like, okay, I'm not giving you $50 million, Mm -hmm. but I will definitely. Here's a five. Right. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like there is a way to revitalize the movies. And I think that. And I mean, and you know, obviously the strike is not going to help whatever these strikes aren't going to help whatever mojo people think this this Barbie Oppenheimer reconsideration of public communal movie going was supposed to do. But I mean, that feels more to me like magic than it does momentum. Mm. Um, I don't know how you feel, but. How do you feel? Um, I, I feel like we're dead in the water. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and even when I go to a film festival, I feel like we're dead in the water. Uh, and I feel like the um, I, I feel like the production side and the creative side isn't broken, but every other aspect uh, is broken. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the distribution, the um, the uh, fin- financing. Um, and I don't know how that's going to change. Uh, and I would love to see somebody take some of the more interesting TikTok people and give them a budget and say go out and 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 fuck up. Um, but yeah. you know, have, yeah. have a good have a good time fucking up. Do something interesting. Discretionary um, spending on TikTokers would be a thing <laughs> that I would yeah. definitely be into. And it would be a very small part of your budget. Um, so- right. You're not going to be, you're not going to go broke doing that. Um, Yeah. And I can think of filmmakers that I would, you know, I still think, I mean, Todd Haynes can do what he wants, but I still would want to give him a budget and, and say, go make what you want. Um, 
or uh, Ty, like, go make what I want you to make. But as long as you want, like, can I convince you to want to make something? Mm. Right. Like, I don't know. I do feel like, I mean, how many pieces have you written in your life where like they weren't your idea, but somebody presented them to you, right? Or, you know, an idea to you. And you're just like, I've been thinking a little bit about that. Or I can, let me think about that. You go and think about it. And there's a whole like actual Thai burr as though it was, you know, you make it yours. Of course. Of course. Um, some of the some of the things I'm happiest having written did not originate with me. And I'm assuming you feel the same way. That's happened. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't know. I just feel like I would love to know if one of the things that got broken along the way to get us to the point where we are now, obviously what I'm saying is probably obviously true because these people are on strike, but there's been some breakdown, I think between the C-suite people and the actual artists oh yeah right oh, yeah well there's always there's always been a gulf i mean that goes back to you know the the louis b mayer days um oh sure although, right yeah but the, but the, but there was a middle ground that um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, of of production people i'm not even gonna say executives of production people um that were 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 creative uh and i think that level starting in the 80s when it became, you know, when the agents started taking over, um, the production people became they, that 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 job uh, qualification. Creativity did not become a qual a qualification for that job category. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, connections did, and putting right people together did, and um, uh, synergy uh, <laughs> synergy did, and. <laughs> You know, um, the, the pitch, the, the elevator pitch did. Um, but, but, you know, when you go back even to the 70s um, and you find like producers like uh, Bert Schneider and, and uh, Bob Rafelson um, thinking creatively, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that and, and they ran a, they ran an independent studio for a while. Um, right. Ran, ran it into the ground, but um, nevertheless, it, uh, it happened. It happened. Yeah. Um, that, and that's only gotten worse in the streaming era because mm -hmm. there's pools money to be made, NFT money to be made. Nobody knows what kind of money it is, uh, and they're all chasing it. And then chasing it, they're dismantling um, a lot of what's worked, um, and and right. not right. and and. Um, not paying the people who are doing the creating so yeah. yeah um well this is just to say somebody when all this if this ever gets solved and i hope that it does asap uh somebody should just you know call spike lee say i i remember that you wanted to make this inside man sequel i don't want to do that because the movie is great the way that it is but like what else would you like to do did you shoot a second of this Viagra musical? <laughs> Would you like to? Um, I don't know. I just feel like he is somebody at this point who is really. I just don't like nobody knows probably how to talk to him. Um, in the business or in person? Business. No, no, no. Business. -wise. It's business -wise. very personable. Yeah. Right. 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 I just feel like nobody nobody knows how to think of how he can bring things to life in his way. And I think that one of the beauties of this movie is like something is being a, a sort of very old, um, fruitful uh, movie genre is, has been, was given something new by a person mm -hmm. who had never been asked to contribute to right. it. Right. Um, and I guess the question is like, what else Spike Lee could you, make a major contribution to and you know what now it's the time because he's he, he's my age he's a couple of months older than i am um which hmm. um yeah, he was I, I read somewhere that the inside man came out on his 49th birthday um and he's uh 66 now and I, I, let me tell you um 50 is different from 65 uh the horizon mm -hmm. looks a little closer and um and you know like Scorsese, who's a more extreme example, 
he, you know, he doesn't have endless number of years left to make endless right. number of movies. So let's do that now, you know? Yeah. Solve the strike, people. Yeah. <laughs> Get these um, actors and writers back to work so they can work for Spike Lee. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm actually convinced that the system has to break down completely before that happens, but I don't know. I, uh, I'm you know, afraid you're right. I'm afraid you're right. Yep. Um, oh, that's, that's a depressing note to end on. Um, so, but the, we, but the bright side is y'all can watch Inside Man. That's like, right. That's right. Um, you got that. Uh, just quickly. But also, um, wait, can I just say really quick? Yeah, the other please. thing about this movie that really moved me watching it now, given all the conversations we're having about AI and what these background actors, these experts yes. do. Yes. Yeah. You're never going to get better acting from AI than the background acting you get in this movie. Like just people standing in line at the bank, <laughs> reacting to people being right. beaten up in a, yep. in a, in a bank officer's office. Like the different reactions among all these people, I just I dare AI to do a better job than well, the human. yeah, they'll do it, but everybody will have eight fingers. Um, so <laughs> no, 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 I, you're you're absolutely right, I, it, and that it goes with the New York genre, um, and you'd never be able to do it. It would just it, you'd never be able to get the idiosyncrasy. That's the thing that AI mm -hmm. can't do is idiosyncrasy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at least yet. Um, so yeah, watch that movie. Um, the movies he's made in the last in the in in the last ten years. Um, what are your what are your feelings about him? Black Klansman, um, Chirac. You're not a fan of uh, Defy Bloods. I think all those movies have good things in them. I think they are unruly to the point of being exasperating. Um, he's not a good. I do not believe him in the past. Um, it's hard to keep him focused on pastness. Um, and some like in Malcolm X, there was like an immediacy to the way he brought the past to life that here. I just feel like there's something there's a porousness that doesn't work. for oh, him. To like, five bloods. He doesn't bloods. even he, do, he doesn't right. even bother with with, you know, um, with aging or anything. He just sort of like throws it aside and figures it'll be a Brechtian or something. I don't know. Right. But that, that it just was too much for me. I couldn't deal with yeah. it. Uh, I mean, I dealt with it in that I watched all of it and there was mm -hmm. like, it was very watchable. Um, but yeah, he hasn't like, I mean, I'm trying to think of the last Spike Lee movie that I, you know what I really liked that <laughs> does not work, but I just feel like it's so defensive and I hate how angry it is. Um, it's like still in an inside man hangover, but it's old boy, a movie nobody needed. I didn't, I, I don't even really think it works, but there's a ruthlessness that was new for him in that film. Um, and I, I just felt like if he could take that anger and do some other movie with it, <laughs> That is, uh, yeah, I, I agree. That is a movie that actually needs to be reckoned with. And it's also the version we see is one that he took his name off. Uh, well, mm -hmm. he took, he took a Spike Lee joint off because it was edited from 140 minutes down to 105. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and no, and the, his cut has never been released. And both he and, um, Josh Brolin really dislike the release version. So for better and for worse, what we see of that movie is not the movie that Spike Lee wanted to make. Um, mm. But it also, because the, you know, Park Chan-wook version is so, you know, adored, um, it, it didn't stand a chance. Um, but I think yeah. it's, I don't think it's an unworthy movie by any, by any stretch of the word. Um, and I, yeah. I think it'll, the, it'll, people will come around to it one way or another um, in years to come. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just, I also think I'm the kind of person who I just feel like this man could keep making movies till, till yeah. he, till he can no longer breathe. So I'm always curious to see what the next thing is. But I mean, this is the longest I think he's gone without, without a new movie. Right. It's been three years since Defy Bloods. Um, so yeah, I get, let's get going on the Viagra musical. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
All right. Well, all that's right. all we, we have time for today. Um, thank you, Wesley. Uh, in upcoming weeks, keep an ear out for new episodes of The Watchcast, where my guests will include uh, film critics Manola Dargis, uh, oh, uh... Gone, Gone Girl uh, author Gillian Flynn. Um, yeah, my old friend from Entertainment Weekly. <laughs> uh, and others. I am Ty Burr, and you are listening to Ty Burr's Watchcast, part of the Substack newsletter, Ty Burr's Watch List. You can find more podcast reviews and tips to navigating the streaming video landscape at tyburswatchlist.substack.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Wesley Morris, for being my guest today. And An honor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, and thanks, Leonard Bernstein, in the background. And, and if anybody can identify the guy on... Um, the other side of Wesley there. Please let it looks like Sydney Geek Green Street on Ozempic is what I yeah. said to Ty earlier. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's our best guess. Um, and thank you listeners for listening and you viewers for watching. Take care. Okay. Thank you.